do a play. Hello, everyone. In the meantime, I want to do a play. Can you see it? Yes. Fantastic. Okay. Hello, everyone. Uh, so this is a bit of a, a side uh, topic, of course, when we speak about the moon, it's not strictly about the moon, but it's about communication in the space industry in general. Before I start, let me give you a couple of uh, slides of background of myself and the entity I work off. I'm Emma Gatti, I'm the editor-in-chief of Space Watch Global, and just a couple of minutes of introduction on what is Space Watch Global and why I'm here in front of you. So... Space Watch Global is what uh, 15 years ago we would have defined a magazine, but now it's kind of difficult to call it a magazine because it does not have a paper version and because we do several other things that are not really uh, only linked with writing articles. So we call each other a media company about space and that's the best uh, uh, definition we found so far. We are based in Germany, so it's a Berlin-based uh, uh, company and is mainly focused on space uh, in its uh, more extended term. So we deal about space uh, in its geopolitical uh, impact, in its economical uh, nuances, uh, in its um, political and policy and regulation issues. So we discuss about space uh, from a sort of global approach. We don't speak only about space science strictly. We, space about, we speak about space economy, space politics, etc. And we try to do it with a, a European cut because we are European. So we try to be focused on Europe, but then open up to the rest of the world. So our first priority is European space, but our second priority is space as a global entity. So we are spread among the five continents, probably not all of them, but we have a newsroom that includes experts from India, from Kenya, from South Africa, from Australia. And so we are literally trying to observe the space industry from every corner of, of the globe, whether it's Asia, South, Africa, South America, so I forgot Brazil, Middle East, Israel, one of them, our main collaborator, et cetera. We do many other, other stuff. I don't know if you know us or not. If you know us as uh, readers, you probably know about our content production, which is writing, podcasting, uh, video interviews, webinars, or you know us because we tend to cover a lot of conferences, especially in, the, in Europe. So you might have met us around the uh, conference if you are someone that loves to travel and go to see conferences about space. So if you see us somewhere, please say hi. Of course, don't be shy. We are also involved with uh, other side tracks, like we do consulting, we do um, conference um, uh, moderation, we do distribution, we do production of several type of uh, multimedia um, tools. But in general, our two main, our main business core is content production of our space in all its shape, written, audio, and video. So this is us, and I hope, of course, come to see us and interact with us on our website, which is very simple, spacewatch.global. How about me? I, this is me, in my most recent form. I am a former uh, researcher, so I come from academia. I have a PhD in geochemistry. Uh, I studied geology in Milan. I'm Italian, as you can hear from the accent. Then I moved to the UK and I, I carry on with the PhD in geochemistry from the University of Cambridge. And after the PhD, I specialized in geochemistry and I applied to go to work at NASA and, and I got it. So I moved to Pasadena from the UK and I stayed in Pasadena for uh, almost six years. And I work at JPL. I don't know if you probably know what it is, and Caltech in the field of planetary geochemistry. So mainly understanding how uh, moon and Mars rocks um, can hold water and how we can use certain geochemical tools on Earth to understand the history of the planets and understanding what happened to the water. So I would say I am an expert. I call myself an expert, but maybe I'm not. But that's my field of research, uh, geochemistry and planetary research of the moon and Mars. In 2018, I left academia. It was a thought, uh, well thought decision. It was something that I was meaning to do much earlier, but I never had the, the courage to jump. And in 2018, I decided to move back to Italy after 12 years abroad 
uh, I left academia and I started freelancing. So I started writing articles for different types of magazines. I started a studio, a science studio about science communication, which is in Milan. It's called The Funnel. And the science uh, since 2022, I'm the editor in chief of Space Watch Global, which is the, um, the platform that I just presented. I started to work for them in 2020 during COVID as a podcaster. And then I take up more and role, more and more roles. It was the right time to start working with them because they were expanding and space was expanding, something that probably all of you already know. So you don't need me to, to explain you that. So that's my story. This is me. What do I want to talk about today? So this is the main question. Does space have a problem in reaching out and transmitting its um its goals uh the answer of course is yes for me <laughs> uh sorry i need to i had to rip, make it smaller again because i was not finding my mouse so let me just let's go back to this one okay so does space have a problem reaching out and transmitting its content of course my answer my personal answer is yes and i'm going to try to use the next 10 15 minutes to to convince you that i'm right or at least to make you think about my thesis so my thesis is that the perception today of what the specter is and what the specter does is um, dangerously skewed uh, first of all, we uh, the, when I speak about outreach and communication, we should define this. I'm not speaking about internal technical communication among experts. Okay, I'm not speaking academic about academic language. I'm not speaking about corporate uh, language between corporates. I'm speaking strictly about how we communicate, what we do to the rest of the universe. Okay, to the outside world, to people that are not necessarily involved with space. So uh, here are my problems um, with how we communicate. The first problem is that uh, space strictly still discuss uh, the, the amount of news that arrive from space to the external world are still very limited. We mainly speak about rocket launches because we like them. They are big, noisy stuff that we launch stuff into the into uh, the outer atmosphere. We like it, so we speak about that. We speak a lot about the first Apollo missions because it was kind of successful, it was positive, we landed on the moon on the first time, so we like to speak about that. And then lately we start to discuss about how rich people are using space for their own private and there was an interest. And so there is a problem in all this because A, this is extremely limited, okay? Space doesn't only do launches, and we are, we don't only deal with human exploration, physical humans that go on other planets. In fact, one of the bigger challenges that we had in the past 50 years is to stop human exploration, which is costly for obvious reason, and become more and more robot and AI dependent, because if you can send a robot to the moon instead of a human, you don't need to send water and air, which is a huge advantage. So all that part of exploration, which is connected with non-human exploration is completely forgotten. All that part of exploration that does not involve strictly a launch or a rocket is also completely forgotten. We have, we as entity, as a domain, thousands literally of missions that deal with the, um, satellites rotating around the orbit and dealing with earth issues. They are measuring oceans, they are measuring uh, ice, they are measuring communities, they are measuring cities, uh, forests, fires, rain, weather forecasting. So many information that come from these satellites, which are part of the major package called Earth observation, and nobody discusses about that, mainly because they are not as flashy as a launch of a rocket. So it seems nobody really cares about them. Why those have a major impact? on how space can impact Earth and Earth sustainability. And then there is this last trend of discussing about space only as a kind of playground for Jeff Bezos or Elon Musk or Branson, whoever. And these receive so much space on the news, so much attention, which in the, in the end 
they contributed to paint space as a sort of like um, playground for rich people that is stealing resources from the real issues on earth, okay? Literally, uh, yesterday, I think, I was on my Instagram, which of course is in the space bubble because this is the job I do, and there was this person, doesn't matter who, who just wrote this sentence and... Uh, if you can read this stance and he says, I need someone to explain to me why it's always if you can pay rent, buy fewer lattes and avocado, and not if you can pay your employees a living wage, buy fewer yacht rockets and spacecraft. Now, besides uh, the, um, the critiques that can be, you might or might not agree with that, what I want to bring at your attention is the fact that rockets and spacecraft are now becoming the defined tools of the rich billionaires who does not have to work and is just using this as a sort of spoiled hobby. So the idea that is uh, spreading more and more is that space is useless and space is uh, a source of depth that is stealing important resources to earth issues, to us humans that instead were uh, struggling with finding solution for climate change, for lack of food, the lack of equality, and whatever you want to put on the list. Now, this is a huge marketing issue, okay? Because it means that nothing of what we're doing gets transmitted to the outside world. If you want to decline this on the moon issue, is also a problem because the 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 press around the moon and the moon exploration is extremely messy. And it's rarely scientifically correct. Um, if you compare what the general press says about what we're going to do on the moon and the scientific literature, there is a huge gap fundamentally, mainly because we have very few data about moon exploration. These data are still in the early stage, but uh, the general press doesn't like it. So pick up some words, put them in an article, and then suddenly it seems we're going to mine the moon for helium-3, which is, of course, uh, like everyone knows within the sector, not something that is going to happen, mainly because, A, we don't know if and how much helium-3 there is on the moon, and B, we don't know how to use it because the technology to use helium-3 is not there yet. So you can see how misleading information there are around. But if we start to add lack of information, misleading information, lack of scientific proof, and general demagogic populistic talks about billionaires, then we are in trouble. So uh, what is the problem? And this is obviously my opinion. OK, so I'm speaking, I'm not putting this one in marble, I'm not saying that this is the only way to think about the problem, but this is how I perceive the problem from, from my desk, okay? Um, first, there are two ways to deal with outreach. Okay, first, first, stage zero. When I speak about outreach, scientific communication, I do not mean advertisement. I do not mean marketing. There is a huge problem in the use of the word communication because everyone attached to the word communication a different meaning. The majority of people that I discuss with often think about communication as marketing, as advertisement. So many times I discuss about outreach campaign with entities and they're like, oh, we already do it, don't worry. And when I ask what they do, they're like, oh, well, we do social media. You know, we have a very good social media manager. So I'm going to say it, social media are not a channel for outreach, for proper education, for proper information. Okay, social media are a marketing tool now. You can use them to hook something and bring them to see your website or to see your campaign. You can use them to advertise something. You cannot use them as an in-depth tool of outreach and information. They're just too limited. So whatever we're discussing here is no advertisement, is no marketing, is proper scientific outreach, which means how to take a complex, important topic and communicate it in a way that people can understand it, digest it, and be engaged with, okay, interested, in other words. So back to us, um, why we struggle. So first, there are two different types of struggles. There is the institution struggle, and there is the private sector. Okay, there are, usually they have different goals. The private sector has a more defined goal, which is the one to sell you something, 
why the institutions, what an institution it can be an agency um, or some public sector, they obviously have a more refined goal because they are trying to use the money that they got from the public entities to create engagement. So in a sort of way, they're even more um, stimulated to let you know what they are doing and why this is important. So starting from the point that obviously institutions are interested in creating outreach. They want you to be engaged. They want you to know how cool are the things they're doing, why they are failing. My personal interpretation, which is again personal, it can be debated, is that we have, we are facing a huge cultural issue in how we digest and transmit scientific knowledge. And we saw it in COVID even more. Scientific knowledge historically is like an ivory tower. We as scientists don't like to transmit it to the outside world. It's considered lowering, it's considered somehow uh, humiliating to having to lower down your topic so that everyone can understand you. So this is a, cold, a huge cultural issue, a huge cultural problem because in general, bringing a scientist to discuss his or her topic to the lay people, it becomes very difficult. A, because they don't like to do it, and B, because they don't know how to do it. Because yet now in this society, there are not enough figures people like me that can pick up the content that the scientists are creating and transform it into something else. There is also a lot to say how you transform it. This. It's more of a practical issue how you actually create a, an engaging scientific storytelling, and we will see it in the next slides. Another cultural problem that I see specifically in the European institution, I see it in Italy all the time, and Europe in that sense is a kind of projection of Italy, we take official communi institutional communications as uh, very serious. We don't come from a place when we think that institutional communication can be lighthearted, can be passionate, can be for everyone, can be engaging. We have not found a way, something that the Americans have instead, to create an engaging, popular communication that can educate, engage, inform, and create passion and interest in the population. We are still very, very rigid. If something is institutional in Europe, it has to be absolutely boring. The Americans are very different, okay? The Americans are a country that uh, when there has been the celebration for the um, beginning of the, um, of the new president, okay, they called uh, Lady Gaga. This is something that we will never see in Europe. Definitely not in Italy. When you call a pop singer to start the inaugural um, mandate of a new president, impossible to think, okay? Uh, this gives you just a marginal idea how different they perceive um, institutional communication. Americans still think that it should be entertaining. We definitely don't dare to enter that, uh, that land. We want it to be absolutely rigid. In fact, it is rigid, and guess what? Nobody is interested because that comes with the turf in a sort of way. Then I have the problem with the private sector. The private sector, in a sort of way, is opposite, OK? If uh, the institutions are extremely dense, uh, the private sector is extremely light. I work with, um, I don't know how many press releases uh, a day. And they're all the same, they're copycat. They use the same jargon, which is a corporate jargon, is completely almost meaningless. They use the same words, uh, usually words like uh, um, disruptive, uh, uh, leading, uh, breakthrough, the kind of things that pump them up. And they are completely meaningless, unfortunately. So on one side, I have the heaviness of the institutions. On the other side, I have the lightness of the private sector that doesn't really give any meaning to what they say. And the result is this gap, this gap of proper, substantial, interesting, and engaging communication that can really communicate what we do without boring the entire population. How to improve? So these are some uh, practical um, tips that I learned doing my job. So I learned uh, on the ground. I learned on my skin from... Um, not being able to catch the attention of uh, the of the audience in the beginning, understanding how to craft it better. You can take them with a pinch of salt. You can take them. You can 
leave them is, is up to you. And I don't know if they will come ever come useful to your work, but uh, it depends a bit on the audience. I teach us so to PhD students science communication and certain things that I'm just about to say, they are the same for any type of science communication outreach, not only for space. Uh, so first problem, always in any type of communication, you need to focus on your target audience, okay? You cannot write a piece of outreach based on yourself, on your own interest, on, on your neighbors, on your peers. You have to focus on the audience, okay? Always, which means put your head in the, put yourself in the shoes of the people that have to receive it and ask yourself, is this interesting? Why people should read me? This is a problem. Um, is a problem on so many levels because it's immediately clear when somebody is not writing for the audience. I see this problem in when I when I read articles written by scientists that are not used to do outreach. You can see it immediately because it's so they are not writing for other people. They are writing for themselves. They are writing for their own peers. I still remember few years ago, I was working with a scientist and she was a statistician, so completely not a space person, but an incredible, interesting and intelligent uh, person with a very good academic position. And uh, she was writing a piece for me and the, print, the piece was fundamentally unreadable. It was impossible to understand what I was saying. And I was trying to help her to, to, to smooth it up, to create a story and to, 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 to make it more engaging, which is not oversimplifying. This is something as it should be added, simplification, oversimplification and banalization of very different things. And in the end she say, well, but what about if my colleagues read me? And then they would think, I don't know my subject. So the first thoughts, the first worry that she was having was about not impressing her peers. So if you're writing to impress your peers, you should not even write because there is no point, you're wasting your time. Don't write to impress your peers. Outreach is about impressing someone else outside. Bring them in, okay? So write for the audience, not for yourself, not for your clients, not for your stakeholders. Have always a target and always keep in mind your target, okay? If you're doing outreach, goes by itself, the target should be someone else, someone outside of it. This is very important. Second point, stop narrating stories of tools. Have a huge um, archive of agencies, private sectors, private companies, single scientists, that they always start to tell a story from the tools, from the satellite. This is satellite is important for, this satellite is called like this, this, this satellite is uh, a joint collaboration. Like if the satellite is the main character of the story, if a satellite is the main character of your story, your story is meant to draw. Nobody's going to be interested because humans are not interested in tools. Humans are interested in humans and in other problems related to humans. So any stories that is meant to go to the outside audience has to start with some humanity. He has to have a human core, a human principle, okay? Always. You have to start from people and from their problems. And then you bring in the tool. The tool is a tool, it's not, it's not a mean to an end, okay? The tool, the satellite, the mission, the lens, the radio, whatever, the antenna you're building cannot be the center of your story. The center of your story has to be something else, humanity, always. The art. The, the, the entire meaning, the entire difficulties of crafting a very good scientific storytelling is the ability to take abstract concepts that nobody knows about because they're too abstract, they're too far out, and transform them in, in, in images that you can process, that our mind can understand, daily images we can relate to. This goes from numbers to tools to missions to everything, okay? This is a problem I often have with writers that come from a, a physics, for example, background. They write numbers that don't mean anything to a normal human because they're too huge. You have to relate the numbers to something that our mind can process. And the entire concept has to be related to something that we can share. 
I remember a few weeks ago, I was at Glock. I was at a conference about climate and, and a, a person started to speak about missions, about satellites. Uh, it gave me the list, you know, because this is how we do. We go to a conference and then we start to give a list of, uh, of, of missions and political involvement and who is uh, with this and who is sponsoring the other one and names. And names are all acronyms and nobody cares about acronyms besides us. And then after some minutes that she was discussing, I said, okay, can you tell me what these, um, these sensors are used for? And there was one that was very interesting. I was about tracking whales. So now you have a link between an abstract concept, a sensor that nobody has ever seen with something that we understand, a tangible problem, whales. Okay, everyone knows you're figuring out a whale at this moment, you can see it in your brain, but you cannot figure it, you cannot be sentimentally or empathically attached to a sensor, but you can understand the concept of a whale. So that's what I mean when I say taking abstract concept and transforming them in images that our mind can process, okay? We need to start from that. That's the starting point. Cross-contaminate with art, okay? Always, I always try to involve artists in our world, to bring in singers, to bring in um, designers, to bring in painters, to, because they are interested in what we do. Okay, but they don't have a scientific perspective. So they have a completely blank canvas on what they want to do. So the merging of the two areas can really bring in a powerful outreach communication because by ourselves, the best we can do is giving very detailed, very correct list about um, tools, again, which is not engaging by any means. So the contamination with art for me is the way forward. Art in its more open term, okay? For me, art doesn't mean only sculptors or painting, art in general, you know, visual art, uh, whatever. I want to give you an example, okay? So I just, uh, few, I, I, I'm, I work a lot with the space for climate change and with, uh, with tools that can help and support the climate change action. We do it in the newsroom. We are very interested in the topic. So I just typed, uh, uh, space for climate NASA and this is what comes out you know beautiful website absolutely stunning visual with a very clear question what is climate change evidence causes very big images that can take you straight to understand the point how do we know climate change is real why is climate change happening visually perfect really well built this is how you create an engaging storytelling then I did the same thing with the European Space Agency, literally same thing, Space for Climate, ESA, okay? And this is what came out, okay? And I think it kind of talks to by itself. I don't really need to explain what's wrong with this, but if you can spend 10 seconds to read it, you will see immediately besides the graphic impagination and structure, which I think it can be improved, um, but, what worries me from a content perspective is how is approached this issue. Satellites provide inequivocal evidence of the changes with five Copernicus Sentinel mission and four Earth Explorer missions. This is a tool focused narrative. We go back to the same point. This is not a human story. This is not a case story. It's not a problem solving story. It's a satellite story. And you know, guess who cares about satellite stories? Only people that be satellites. But then it's not outreach. Because if you're talking from the industry to the industry, then this is not outreach. You're not promoting your mission outside. You're just talking to each other, OK? Maybe you're writing this for the Italian Space Agency or for the DLR of, uh, of NES, fine. But you are knocking on a door that is already open. And you are speaking about satellites with people that already know about satellites, OK? so. Not sure about that. And clearly a tool focused narrative. I challenge you in see which is the page that is more interesting for you. Okay. Why so difficult? Uh, I don't want to banalize the issue. Okay. I don't want to say that uh, it's difficult because we are lazy. It's difficult because we are not looking in the right direction. I mean, partially, yes. But I think it's difficult because 
creating a new way to do space outreach, it requires a new language for science outreach. It really requires to review and rewrite and restructure all the rules that we have used so far for science and space uh, uh, outreach. It really requires, in my personal opinion, a profound cultural shift in the way we perceive science and communication. So it's a double challenge, okay? Because it's not only about communication, a more effective way to be educate, educational, informative, and engaging, but it's also about science. Because science is complex, okay? It's not so immediate. Colors are much more natural for us, but understanding a physical equation is not so easy. So you need to start from a level of simplification, engaging a storytelling that allows the complexity and the nuances of the scientific knowledge to still be preserved, okay? You don't want to diminish them. This is what scientists and researchers are always worried, that you're going to just diminish and translate badly and then everything has uh, becomes a, a huge misunderstanding. So we need to preserve the scientific method, but at the same time, we need to tell an engaging and empathic story. An empathic story cannot start from tools, cannot start from satellites. It cannot start only from the mere description of the rockets. Okay, plus, uh, and I'm gonna throw this in, uh, is becoming extremely gender biased also. The majority of the space outreach so far is about rockets and how they've been built. Fantastic, is a fantastic, fantastic uh, geek den. They love to speak about how tall is the rockets and etc. I'm not diminishing this part, but it cannot be the only focus, okay? Mere technological narrative, when I tell you how uh, bigger is this rocket from the one before, is interesting, I acknowledge that, but it's not the only part of the story. It's not the only way to tell the story, okay? We can and we must inform, educate, and entertain at the same time, and we need to find a common language to do that. And this is why I say it's not trivial. I'm very aware of the challenge, okay? I don't want to diminish this. I had the chance. Uh, Alessandro, how are we doing with the time? Sorry. I don't want to carry on speaking. I'm at the time is finished, but uh, let Perfect. me say that this uh, lecture is so interesting that uh, I don't stop you. <laughs> okay, <laughs> so let's see this. Let's see this. this. <laughs> profound cultural shift. Uh, and I, see, I hope that this two days is, uh, let me say, a, a step in that way. Perfect. So if you can finish, but if not, uh, take your time. No, no, of course. I'm going to show the last, uh, this is the last slide, so you know where to find us if you want to engage with us or if you want to tell me that I'm completely wrong with this. I did this intervention a month ago and it just inflamed Twitter because somebody got very upset with me saying that I was uh, saying that science is exclusive. Why is not? I'm not saying the science is exclusive. I'm just saying that we struggle to accept the fact we don't know how to communicate what we are doing, and we do not accept that how we communicate at the moment is wrong. Okay, so I'm not saying that science is exclusive. This is a final slide. I give the floor back to Alessandro, and of course, if there are any questions, I'm super happy to take them and to answer if I can, of course. <laughs> so and here Stefan. is where you can find us. I can only say in... Uh... As space people say, copy, message, uh, get it. And uh, okay, I think that uh, from the audience, there is no question, but I think that uh, we have the possibility later or also maybe tomorrow to make some question to Clement. Thanks again for thanks to you. Uh, crucial lecture.